Greetings, everyone, and welcome to a, a second episode of War Game Recruitment, the video series where I try to introduce Graham to the joys and the wonders of war gaming, historical war gaming primarily. I don't know, maybe we'll do some space war gaming or fantasy war gaming, but generally historical war gaming. So the first episode, we kind of got an idea of what Graham's likes and dislikes may be, uh, what interests him. And then uh, we had a chance to play a couple of games. So we thought we'd take this episode to talk about the games that we played, see what Graham maybe liked, didn't like, um, if things were too easy, if they were too hard. You know, just kind of a, a I guess, you know, in, in war gaming, we call it kind of an after action report, even though this one's not about a specific battle or scenario. It's an after action report for how shell shocked Graham is after his uh, baptism of fire, shall we say. Now, I will say that, so we played two different games. So Dean figured he'd kind of ease me gently into tour gaming. And uh, I'll be interested to know from our viewers whether he did the right path to <laughs> well, easing okay, people so into the hobby. The, the, uh, the, the first one was definitely an ease into the into the war game. Yeah. And then, you know, it's kind of like taking a kid to the pool and they, they kind of wade into their ankles like, oh, this isn't too bad. And then you grab them and you fling them into the deep end. Well, it wasn't super deep, but it definitely was, uh, you know, if in a pool where you start to get that you go down the little uh, incline or decline, I guess, of the, you were three quarters of the way down that <laughs> before you you panicked and had to put your floaties on and come back to the to the safe side. So, all right. So the first game that I uh, that we were able to play and we played these on Vassal. We, we haven't played them face to face, so we're kind of limited on what we're playing. But I thought, you know what? I there's a there's a great um i guess a little introductory style of war game although some people probably have never even heard of this because it's a small publisher some people maybe don't even consider it a war game but i thought you know let's try out table battles table battles by holland spiel is definitely a light game it is um oh i'm trying to think what it is off of um top of my head i know it's i think it's less than a two for sure do you remember I don't remember, but I, I know it was less than two. Yeah, so it's a 1.78 on, on BGG. And it only, well, it plays two players. I guess you could play it um, solo if you wanted to because it's just rolling dice. But again, it's put out by Holland Spiel. And it is one where if you, so if you're, if you're already into war gaming and you're used to chits and counters and hexes, you would look at this game and probably say, okay, I, I don't, I'm not sure this is a war game or, you know, this is nothing that, that I would typically um, think of because it is just cards, dice and little wooden, I call them like matchsticks, little wooden matchstick sized pieces, which represent the strengths of your units. And in this game, you are, everything is very abstracted. I mean, it, it runs the gamut of time. We played some uh, games during Alexander's time period. I think we played, I'm trying to think what the, what the first couple were, um, what the time period was that American revolution or yes, it was something but, in Europe, I think. Yeah. It's definitely like more horse and musket, uh, time period. But anyway, so the, the game transcends most time, time periods because everything is abstracted out. you each person has maybe six, seven, eight cards in front of them with a number of matchsticks representing the strength of those units. And then you are literally just rolling dice and placing those dice on certain cards that require those that that uh, die value, and, and the rules of the game are pretty simple. You can only, um, for the most part, you can only place dice on one card um, on any given turn. Uh, sometimes you might have a special ability that might allow you to place two dice on two different cards, depending on the wings of of your uh, commands, and then you are deciding if you want to trigger off or use the action of those cards that have the dice. And sometimes you are forced to um, to react, which will kind of take the momentum away from you, and it kind of goes back and forth. So that's just a very quick, um, brief overview of it. For you, Graham, I guess the first question I would ask is: Was this a was this a type of war game that you thought you were going to play, or did you even did, did you consider this to be a war game? I guess uh, I don't. To answer your first question, did I expect this as a war game? No, I didn't. When you say war game, this is definitely not the style of game I would 
I would think of if you said, let's, let's play a war game. After playing it, do I think it's a, as a war game? <laughs> um, I guess it's going to depend on if a war game is classified as two armies battling each other, then yes. Now, my one of my problems with the game, and we'll get into this as we talk more about these, is I understand some of the time periods I understood, like if we're talking of the Alexander time frame, I kind of know a bit of that history. When when we did the battle in, in Europe, it wasn't as, like I didn't know what the battle was. And because of that, I didn't, I didn't feel like a war game to me. That, that one felt very abstract because with me not knowing anything about the time frame or the, the battle in particular, it's like, well, okay, so I basically have card A, B, C, and D. Yes, they're called, you know, left wing and this person's battalion and you have, you know, the special card for this battle. It didn't mean anything to me. This one took fours only and I needed three fours to trigger it off to attack, you know, the card on your side. So in that, in that case, they felt like a war game. But when I think of a war game, I'm expecting, I'm expecting, you know, a bit of the history around it. Like this is the battle of whatever you are this side, I'm this side. And uh, if you look at like commands and colors, uh, ancients, they kind of give you a history over, you know, a very brief paragraph of what this battle was about. I didn't feel that with the, this game, it was like, this is just kind of two armies going head to head that I don't have much. I don't have much knowledge of over what I'm doing. And it, it felt like a very abstracted, war game so yes i think you would classify it as a war game but definitely on the lighter side and definitely a lot more on the abstract side i think this is a type of game that if people are used to playing lighter euro games with that dice rolling you know dice placement and triggering cards that's it's pretty much what it is it just happens to have a war theme on it yeah so in in table battles and um how the cards are designed is if my card is going to tell me exactly who I'm allowed to attack um, and I, and you're going to work from left to right. So I might have three different units listed, but I can only attack unit a of grams. And then once that unit has been destroyed, then I can move on to the next uh, unit. And then when that one's destroyed, I can move on to the next unit. I can't pick and choose. So I'm kind of, you're kind of hedged in as to who you can actually fight against, which makes since from the standpoint of if these are linear battles, you know, if I've got my left wing, I'm, I'm going to be fighting the units that are directly across the battlefield at me. I can't just pick and choose who I want to, who I want to fight. So that made thematic sense. And I, I think that I will agree with you. If you don't know anything about the particular battle you're fighting before you start the game, then it's hard for you to kind of, it's hard for you to understand, okay, well, why am I doing this? Because historically I don't have a basis to make that, to, to make that, um, that connection to it. What I did find with, with this game was that it did lead me to then looking up the battles online to kind of say, Oh, well, that makes more sense as to, you know, this or that. And they, they try to do a good job with, um, you know, if it's, if it's a, um, historically, if it's a battle where, you know, my side was more defensive than the, the, the dice values and the attributes on my cards make me a better defensive, um, take a better defensive position than, than I would if I was on the offense. Because there are some things on this card which are, um, are going to automatically force you to react or to screen against your opponent. Uh, a lot of times you have the choice, of, okay, well, I wanna, I'm gonna use my action, I'm gonna attack your unit. But if someone attack, says, so I attack you, if you already have dice on that card, you can then be forced to screen against me, which will kind of cancel out my attack, but it also forces you to waste your dice off your card and it counts as an action towards your next turn, which means you are not going to go on the, the offensive. You're going to have to kind of reset because you, you took a defensive, um, a defensive action. So from that standpoint, I, I thought there was quite a bit of, well, I'll say quite a bit, but there was strategy involved in this game because the strategy of 
Do I want to just go ahead? I know it's not going to be a great attack, but it's going to force my opponent to screen, which is going to waste their dice, and it's going to take their ability to attack me next turn away, which gives me more time to maybe set up a better defense. Did you feel that at all during this game? Or was Definitely. it just simply, here are the die values, this mathematically is what the, I should do, and I went with that? No, definitely the ability to force other people to defend if they have dice on there um, was an interesting strategic point because it was like, okay, well, Dean could be trying to attack me or I'm trying to build up my army to do a big massive attack. But if I can attack him and do no damage, but it still forces him to use his turn to do that. So I attack. And your action on your turn is basically just to respond to my attack. Now, could cancel it. So basically nothing, nothing happens, but I've just wasted your turn. So then hopefully when it comes back to my turn, then I can start going, okay, well, I've kind of weakened that, that area. My biggest thing was it was almost as if you had to have two attacks ready to go at the same time. So I'd use one attack to go against you to force you to empty out the dice from your, the person I'm attacking to nullify the first attack. Then I had I needed to make sure I had a second attack ready to go, basically then to do the damage to you, because you're gonna you would have to use up all your dice and it's it's a it's a mandatory I think it's mandatory to always respond if you if you're able to. For most of them, it is. Yeah. So I kind of felt I always needed that one two punch ready to go, and I found getting that one two punch. That I think that last game we played lasted for what like half an hour, forty minutes, just because we could never get that one two punch going because you would say. I'm building up my one and getting ready for two. And it's like, well, I can see you're getting ready for your two. Therefore, I'm going to basically nullify your one. So, so then you have to kind of build back up. And just kind of, it was just sort of this back and forth of just luckily getting the one, two punch that you needed at the right time. Yeah, because but, in this game, was it, go ahead, finish out. I was just going to say, but it's still that strategic. You have to be watching what your opponent's doing to try and basically cut them off at the knees. So then you can do your thing. It just, because of the randomness, it was very difficult to cut you off of the knees and then kind of counterattack. It was like cut yourself off of the knees, then build yourself up, and then they cut you off by the knees, and then you know they build it. And it just kind of went back and forth of just this getting ready, reset, getting ready, reset, getting ready, reset, and not being able to kind of make that final push. But I think that's kind of inherent in the dice roller. Yeah. And so as I say, in this game, most of the games take 15, 20 minutes to play. You can get kind of stuck in that loop where maybe it takes a little longer. But I think some interesting things about this game, which, again, I think when you first sit down and you play it, you're like, okay, this seems really light. This, you know, whatever, we're going to roll some dice. But it's not a Yahtzee-style game. You're not re-rolling any dice per turn. You're stuck with what you roll. And you only have, what, six dice um, to even roll. And once you allocate those dice to a card, they're locked in there until you use them. So, you know, I must start with six. Maybe I've got four to roll next time. Or maybe I've got three to roll. Because, you know, like you said, you're trying to set up multiple attacks. And now you've got maybe four dice out on the cards. So now I'm only rolling two dice. The more dice you allocate out there is really going to, again, it's going to hamper you with, with the dice you're going to be rolling that turn unless you use your actions to um, get rid of those dice before you, you know, before you roll uh, for that turn. And I, I think that is also part of the strategy. And I think another part of the strategy in this game is some of your units, you know, you might need doubles to use the action. And then when you use that action, it might say, okay, you automatically do one hit, or it might say you do one hit per die, or it might say you do one hit and you take one hit, or you, maybe you get one hit per die and you take one hit. So the, the units that you're using, their strategy, because there was times I'd be like, oh man, I, I overloaded with like, I think I put four dice on one of my units in the middle and not realizing early on that, okay, so when I trigger off that unit and it takes doubles, I'm only, I can only use one set of doubles for my understanding, but it's still going to use up all my dice, which I can clear them, but it doesn't give me any benefit to have more than two dice on there. So that's, you know, that's kind of the, the strategy. And then the other part of it was it got down to the point where I had taken so many casualties that if I was going to attack you, I basically was going to kill myself off in the process. 
So then so, hey, well, I don't really need to, I can't attack anymore, but I need to defend. I need to, um, uh, what is it? it's not screening. It's uh, what's the one where, is it absorbing? Or where I can take another unit uh, to my left or my right, and they can absorb the casualty um, from the unit that's being targeted. I think it's a, I, I can't remember off the top of my head the exact term they use, um, but they're basically absorbing the casualty. So I need to put dice on them so they have the ability to do that. So there are little, there are a lot of little um, intricacies and, and kind of, um, kind of synergies between some of the cards out there on the table because, hey, this one can absorb for this unit, this one can absorb for this unit. And when you to win the game just to um i think i can't remember if every game is the same but usually there's like five cubes and i might start with one cube and graham might start with four cubes and they're basically point cubes and then you're just moving these cubes back and forth as units get eliminated and then whenever you end up with no cubes you lose the game and sometimes if you well, well, there was a rule that if we if we both kill each other off or destroy each other's units in a turn, nobody gets a cube. I think it is. Yeah, and there are some units that have a star on them as well, and if you right. kill that unit, you get the two cubes on your side. Right. But again, if it's a mutual killing, no one gets the cubes. Yeah, and so sometimes it was more advantageous to rather than just let let you destroy my unit to just go ahead and attack. And basically mutual assured destruction. I destroy myself, you I can take you out at the same time, but then nobody gets the cube. Yeah, it sucks I don't get a cube for taking you out, but it prevents you from getting the easy, the easy cube by taking me out on, on your next turn, especially if I can see that you have dice on there on, on your on that unit. So I do think there's more strategy in this game than what it initially lets on to be, but it's still not a heavy game. I mean, you could sit down and probably play this game with almost anyone. And because it plays so fast, I mean, we played the same scenario, I don't know, three or four times because I was getting so pissed off because I couldn't beat you. And that's the other thing about this game is I don't, and you asked this question early on, I think after we played the first couple of times, is this game designed to be balanced? And I don't believe it's designed, these battles are not designed to be balanced. I think they're historical battles and the designer has set them up so that probably they should play out historically accurate 80 percent of the time and you're always going to have luck because of the dice but i don't think that they ever worried about mathematically making sure that this is exactly an even fight because that's not really what the purpose of the of the game is to be it's it's recreating battles on the tabletop which yeah sometimes it sucks to just be on the, on the other side but for me i lost and i lost and i lost but I still kept wanting to come back and, and try it again because I thought, okay, maybe if I try this, it'll, it'll work out differently. Yeah. I think you are, I mean, kind of hit the nail on the head saying it, it's, you start off by saying it's kind of like the Yahtzee dice rolling, but there's more to it. And I think you're right. I think you can sit down and play this with anybody because it literally is just rolling dice and allocating one number uh, to a card. But I think that will get you going but I think there is a lot more strategy to it than just rolling the dice and just, you know, picking a die at random or saying, Oh, well, this is my really powerful unit. So I'm always going to take dice for it. Not that's probably not your best path. I mean, you do need to be looking and I think you would get that fairly quickly mm -hmm. that you then start to need to think about, okay, well with the, with these dice rolling, let me look at what the other opponent has, where are they going to be able to trigger? Do I need to defend? So I, I like that there wasn't just a, there wasn't always an obvious choice. You roll your dice, you're hoping to get a six or whatever that you need to put on your card. But then you also have to look at what were you trying to do and how you how are you going to stop the other person from doing what you know they can do? So I I, I like that there was that bit of it that there was definitely a piece of strategy to this game as opposed to just rolling the dice and kind of oh, you know, I, I scored, I rolled three threes. Well, that's great. But if the card that takes threes, you can only put one at a time on the card, then those three threes are wasted. So you may want to look at the other dice that you've rolled and the whole allocating and locking them in until they're triggered. Again, you could be, oh, I'm going to get all my dice out really quick. But then if you can't trigger them, you're not going to be rolling any dice. You know, that, that dice pool, die pool that you're rolling shrinks as you allocate them. And that's another thing you need to be looking at. So I did enjoy that it was easy to get into 
but there was more depth to it than just a standard dice chucker. Yeah, I think, I think for sure it is, um, it is one where I probably spent as much time, not only hoping that I would roll the die that I thought I needed, but also looking at what, at what you were doing on your side, because sometimes even though I thought, okay, I really want this side so I can trigger off this attack that can mean nothing. If I look at yours and go, okay, well, I've got to do something to, to screen against this attack over here. And there were certain cards. And, and I think it was in the Alexander game we played where you had one of your cards. So in this game, if you have, um, there's some cards you're going to have in front of you that are going to be different colors. So if I have a red, a blue and a pink, technically I've got three different sections or three different wings, well, two wings and a center to my, to my army, which means I could place one die on one wing and one die on the other wing because they're two different ones. Graham had one where his were all the same color. So they were all the same unit, but I believe he had a commander card where as long as that unit in the center was still around, he could place two die, two die every turn. And so I was saying, okay, I've got to get rid of that unit in the middle because then that's going to take him down to only being able to place one die per turn. And, and there are lots of those different types of little nuances with, within the game. I definitely, um, I, I will agree. I, it, it's, it's definitely got more strategy than, than what I would have initially thought or what I did initially think of it. And, and like I said, there's, there's the base game of it, which comes with, I don't know how many different scenarios or battles and then you can buy these little expansion packs which i think they're 20 bucks maybe 25 bucks and you get a deck of cards and i forget how many cards are in there but it's i don't know and it's all these different units and then scenarios or battles that you get as well so the price point is pretty cheap i think the base game is 25 bucks which you're gonna be you're not getting a whole lot other than dice match dicks and cards um and then the expansions are are pretty reasonably priced as well i i don't know i haven't we played it on, on Vassal. Um, and I, uh, I, I enjoyed it. I think it had, you know, for what it is and for, you know, to me, it, it's a, it's a filler, it's a filler war game. Not that you can't play it over and over and over again, as we did uh, on Vassal, but you could just play a one-off game and, you know, and then move on to something else. And there's a ton of different battles, ton of different scenarios. Um, so I don't know. It, it was, it was more than I thought it was going to be, and I did enjoy it. I didn't love it, but I, I definitely enjoyed it and see where it's got its its a uh, place in, in war gaming. Would you play it again? I mean, did you enjoy it enough? I mean, I know you probably enjoyed the Alexander, and again, I think it's that's the downside to it. If you don't know historically about the battles, then it's just going to be an abstract game to you. But if you do know the battles, um, it could could be a little better for you. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I would play it again because it is quick. We just had that one game where it kind of got into this repetitive loop. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, for a 15, 20 minute filler, it's like, yeah, I would play it again. I don't think I would buy it. Right. Because, because it is so abstracted, it is so close to other Euro style games that are of the same length that have maybe not the, the strategic... I don't want to say strategic de depth, but they kind of give you the same type of thing, but without the, the war gaming uh, theme on it, but still kind of give you the same idea of rolling dice and then deciding where, where they're going to allocate your dice and when you're going to trigger them off. Um, again, because of my Euro gaming background, I'd probably gravitate to those. But if I was, you know, with you at a con and we said, you know, we have half an hour to kill and he said, Hey, you want to play table battles? Like, yeah, sure. Like it was enjoyable, but right. it's, it was an enjoyable game that was not one I'm going to be hankering to to add to my collection. Sure, yeah, and and in comparing it to like some of the lighter dice games with Euro games, I'd say the biggest difference in this is, I mean, yeah, time wise is going to be about the same, but you know, a lot of the lighter dice games tend to be multiplayer solo or multiplayer solitaire. You know, whether you're doing Rolling America or you know whatever, some sort of roll and write. This one is definitely very interactive. Okay. <laughs> I mean, because everything you do, your opponent has to somehow keep in check or at least recognize what you're trying to do. May not be able to stop it, but at least have to recognize it. All right, so that was Table Battles by Holland Spiel. 
Um, check it out if you haven't. I, I hadn't really heard of it until I started doing some digging around. I, I have quite a few Hollandspiel titles. And when I looked at it on their catalog on the internet, I just kind of skimmed past them like, yeah, whatever. I, you're not interested. And I saw someone else talking about it. And I thought, okay, well, let's let's give that one a try. So, so that was his dipping his toe into the into the semi-warm waters of the the friendly wargaming pool. And then I grabbed him by the arm and I drug him into the deep end, kicking and screaming, and we dove into Combat Commander. Now, before you say, oh my God, why would you put him into Combat Commander uh, right after table battles? Because he owns Combat Commander. And I thought he at least maybe had read the rules or played around with the rules. Now, I did ask him to read the rules before we sat down, but I told him, I said, you know, just read through the, read through the, you know, the, the basic part of the rules. Cause we're going to play scenario one. If you know, combat commander scenario one is fat Lipke. It's very much an introductory style of a scenario. There's no artillery. There's no, um, there, there's no flamethrowers or satchel charges or more mortars. It's infantry on infantry pretty basic stuff. So I guess before we get into the game itself, what were your thoughts going into combat commander? Combat you at com least had an, an understanding of what it was. Yes. Uh, combat commander is kind of what I was expecting from a war game that it was, you know, a hex map with your little chips for your, your, um, your units and you're moving them around the board, trying to get in a position to, you know, attacking or whatever the war game terms are, I guess, flanking, whatever, you know, you are, it's not only attacking, but it's also the strategic positioning of your troops on the board and trying to get into the right position or running through the open, of course, is more risky than going through the, the force and all that. So that was from reading the rules. It's like, okay, yeah, this is what I was expecting for war game. Um, more so than the table battles. It's like, okay, th this feels like a war game. This is what I'm expecting from a war game. It, plus it helped that the, the rule book has its all section 12.1.2 point, point, point <laughs> subsection okay, so, B. Yeah, and so that was going to be my next question. Did you, I mean, you read a lot of rules. I mean, you, you play a lot of heavy Euro games. Did you find the rule book to be set up well or did you find it off-putting did you find it intimidating i mean because even though you read a, you play a lot of heavy games i mean generally their their rule books aren't as long as a as a gmt game or as a war game but i also think that especially gmt they're very well laid out and very well designed now yeah. you may disagree with that i don't know but okay from reading the, the rule book uh, comparing it to like a let's say another heavy um, Euro game, the kind of daunting piece of it is, and I'm sure once you get into if you know if you're more familiar with war games and how they work and all that, it may you may not see it. But coming from a war game point of view, uh, sorry, coming from a Euro game point of view, I can read a rule book that's 40, 50 pages long, and I'm okay with that. And I find though reading a rule book for war again, I'm just going off on combat commander. I'm not saying I'm an expert on war game rule books, but Euro games tend to be a lot more of a surface type thing. Like you can do action A and action A, you know, you move your person here and you, you take this action, get some cubes, get some resources, or you can do action B and you know, it's going to be trading with the person next to you, that type of thing. I find what was kind of daunting for combat commanders, like you can do action A and action A has all these 10 kind of 10 sub things and all those 10 sub things will have requirements or things you're going to be modifying. So you want to, you want to fire a weapon. Well, where are you? What terrain are you in? What terrain are they in? What's in between you? What type of weapon are you firing? And it's all kind of this branching thing. So you kind of get down as you're reading the rule book, you kind of get down, 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 and you kind of go, wait, there were other actions I could do with firing a weapon, wasn't there? Okay, so then you kind of work your way back up and kind of follow that route. So it got to the point when the actions you were doing made sense. I want to, I want to move my troops. I want to fire my weapon. I want to dig into a foxhole. You know, you kind of understand those, but it was like, okay, you want to fire, fire your, your weapon? Okay, now read these next four pages on all the things that can happen when you fire your, your weapon or depending on what type of weapon you're firing. And 
contrast that to Euro games, I found, again, Euro games are, they may have a lot of individual rules, but each individual rule is kind of more contained. That if you fired a weapon in a Euro game, you may have one or two paragraphs of, okay, flip over a card or roll a die or, you know, look at you, the car that you're firing and it'll tell you what you need to hit and how many dice you're rolling. This was, okay, read the next couple pages to figure out how to fire your weapon. So there were maybe not as many top level rules as there are in Euro games, but they, they kind of triggered off a whole other subset of things you needed to know for it. So coming into it, it's like, okay, I've read the rules and I understand at a high level how the game works. And that's why it was, it was a big advantage to be playing with someone like Dean who's played the game before. Cause they're like, okay, so I want to fire a weapon. So what do I do again? You know, okay, I need to play my card and wait, how many dice do I roll? And then Dean was, or what do I need to hit? And Dean was like, okay, well, because I'm in a building that does this, you're outside the building, you're firing across the fence, you know, you're in whatever. So give me all the modifiers for it. Um, you know, as the game went on, I kind of, I remembered a lot of things I needed to add, but it was always nice to have Dean there to say, oh, don't forget you need to do this or don't forget I'm here and, you know, you have a, a leader in your group and are you going to be firing as a group or each individually? Because that's going to modify, you know, how many dice you're rolling. And that's where it got complex for me. I knew I wanted, what I wanted to do, but having to go back to the rule book to find out which subsection apply to the situation I'm in was the, the more daunting piece to the war game. And I think, so with Combat Commander, if you don't know it, Combat Commander is a card-driven war game. So there are no dice. The dice um, are on the cards. And so for everything you're basically doing in this game, you're flipping a card. And each each side has its own individual nationality deck. And they're, they're, they're slightly different. I mean, for the most part, I mean, they, you know, I might have more of this type of card in my deck. You might have more of this type. And then the events are, are different as well. Um, but you're basically flipping a card for every, everything you're doing. And I think that as, as you were alluding to with the rule book, how it was, you know, you had to kind of grasp what you could do for this action. And then, okay, if you do this action, you need to think about these things. I think on top of that, you were also dealing with understanding your deck for your, for your, you played the Russians. So you were trying to understand that, that Russian deck. And you're trying to understand the how the Russians work best. And that's why I think whether it's you or anyone else in any of these games, it always is crucial to read the designer notes. And GMT does a good job with their de designer notes, but also in the, in the base game where they break it down as, okay, if you're playing the Germans, these are things the Germans are good at. If you're playing the Russians, these are things the Russians are good at. And I think once you kind of understood, okay, I'm playing the Russians, I've got a lot more people than Dean has as the Germans. I just have to use some of them as fodder because I, I think initially on you, you know, you wanted to sit back and you want to try to shoot me, uh, fire at me to get me out of the buildings. I'm like, that's not going to work. I mean, because of the modifiers I have, yeah, you know, you're going to cause me to flip cards, but unless I get something freaky, I'm not leaving that building. And then once you figure out, okay, so I need to close assault or melee, and then we work through the rules. Okay, well, this is how you have to do it. And you, you know, you can only melee if you advance, you know, so you have to advance one hex. So you're going to have to get close, survive the fire, and then advance the next turn. Well, in order to do that, okay, now I need to make sure I have an advance card in my hand. And I need to, so it's the, it's the rules, it's the strategy of how my units work. And then it's a strategy of, I need the cards in my hand. And in this game, and I told you early on, because it's, it's it's hard for um, whether you're a war gamer or not, because some war gamers don't like card driven games, but it's hard to understand, OK, there's going to be some turns where I'm just discarding as many cards as I can, because these do nothing for me. Yes, maybe five turns from now, this would be great to have this card, but I can't waste a spot in my hand for what may be five turns from now. So I need to discard to get the cards into my hand. Okay. Oh, I got an advance. I mean, the beginning of the game, I had so many times where I can't remember if it was, I couldn't move or I couldn't, whatever it was. It's like, man, I'm like, am I ever going to get, you know, a movement card or a, a fire card or whatever it was I was looking for. And so you go through kind of those cycles. So in, in combat commander, I definitely think it's a, yes, there's a learning curve to it for sure, because it's, 
I don't know, what is it, a three point something on BGG? Yeah. But I mean, so because you got the rules, you got the cards, you got, you know, how, how your units play. And I think once by the end of the, by the middle of the game, I think you were understanding, okay, there are, there are times when I need to discard. There are times when I need to just, you know what, if I lose the troops, I lose the troops. Um, there, there are times when it's like, I, I'm kind of forced to do certain things that maybe I don't want to do, but I, but I have to. And I, I guess I, I, my question to you is what did you find to be the hardest part? I mean, I know you just talked about the rules, but did you, did you find the card play or the tactics of what you need to do out on the battlefield to be the hardest part or the the biggest learning curve? And again, I mean, it's the first time you played it. So, I mean, I think for me, the, the hardest part of the game was the, as you alluded to before, the learning your deck. Because I'm used to being able to come into a Euro game and saying, this is how I'm going to approach the Euro game this time. I'm going to take the strategy of resource generation. I'm going to take the strategy of trying to get as much land. This was, you have to play to the strengths of your deck. So if you are playing the Russians in that fat Lipke, there's a way to play it. You have to be going in, as you said before, I Russians have more army, so don't bother shooting, go in for the, the melee attack. I'm used to having games give me options. I'm used to being able to say, I don't want to do melee this time. I want to try and sit in the forest and ping you off. That's never going to work. Well, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it, but you're not likely to, to win. Yeah. So it was like, okay, well, you have, to, you have to kind of give up on the, I'm going to play the game I want to play and think of more of the historical th- thematic piece of this of, no, no, you aren't playing some abstract alien race on a different planet. You are playing the Russians during this battle. This is how they approach the battle. Therefore, you have to approach the battle the same way. So you're, you're very, you kind of have to understand that. And that's what I found difficult at the beginning because I didn't know my deck. I didn't know the battle. I didn't, I read the designer's notes, uh, which is something I've never done before. So I kind of knew that, yes, the Russians had more people that they just threw at, at, the, the, uh, at the enemy. But again, coming from a Euro game, all your people are, are precious to you. I've named all my little shits. <laughs> but that, w- that w- for me was the most difficult. I mean, the rules you can get through, the learning how to approach the game based on which side you're playing, I found difficult to do because I'm not used to having games dictate how you should be approaching it. And I'm not saying the game was saying, okay, move here, move here, move here. It was like, no, no, your armies aren't designed to sit back and you know lob bombs or whatever else. Your army is advancing and trying to engage these people because you have the mass. So you're not that good at, at the, the gunplay. You can still do it. I mean, you can still try and ping people off, which I did it early on, but then it came to realize this isn't working. So I need to shift to more of thematic of what my armor should be doing. And then it kind of, it made more sense, but that getting for me, getting over that stumbling block early on of not knowing the deck and wanting to play my own game and not realizing, no, no, you, you kind of have to play, you can play your own game within the confines of the role you're playing within the battle. Yeah. Because with, um, I think it only took you a f- few turns to realize Hey, my Russians, my firing range is not as good as the Germans' firing range. Yeah. So for you to sit back in the woods with your rifle squads wasn't going to work because it was too far away. So then you were just down to firing your machine guns, which were still pretty potent. And um, but yeah, you do have to you do have to adapt to what you have. Just like with the objective chits, you know, and in combat commander, there's one common objective that everybody knows at the beginning of the game. And then you have a secret objective. I have a secret objective. And there are five different objective points out on the board where last person that passes through it takes control of it. And it just so happened, I think, that both of our secret objectives were the same building, which made, I think mine was worth five points. Yours was, I mean, it made it worth a ton of points. So we were, you kicked me out of that building and I was trying, I did a last ditch effort to keep, to try to get you out. But you, um, in order to do that, I had to move a squad and a, and a leader 
across an open <laughs> across an open road hex to try to get to the woods across the other side so I could mount my attack and you you shot him up. So that uh that pretty much nullified that and ended the game. But did you find did you do you like the idea of this secret objective? I mean it makes it great for replayability and, and variability. Um not that you're probably gonna play I mean I, I've played Fat Lipke several times only because it's always an introductory scenario and that's generally i'm always showing somebody new but there's so many scenarios and everything in the game of combat commander i don't know how often i'd ever worry about going back and replaying stuff um but did you find that that also kind of i mean obviously it had to have forced you to take a certain a certain strategy within the game because if 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 your hidden objective wasn't that building and worth five points would you have worried about close assaulting it probably not um probably yeah you're you're right i probably would not have gone for that if i see that you know you camped in and whatever building that number what that is and let's say my my point was i need to control somewhere else i probably just would have gone for the other thing and just camped out there now i one of the i think the public objective was one i got early on i just, I just camped people there it was the one up mm-hmm. kind of on the far right of the board and yeah, my secret objective was the same as yours. So I'm not sure how that works. Again, I only played this once. So I'm not sure how that works is if I don't care whether you have your secret objective or not. Well, at the end of the game, if, if our secret objectives haven't been revealed, and sometimes they do get revealed in the game, um, you just reveal them and then you score the points. So let's say ours weren't the same and I had building five and it was worth five points and I held it at the end of the game, I would just get those five points at the end of the scenario. And then you'd get your points for yours. And then whoever had the common objective would get, you know, generally as soon as you, if it's a known objective and you take it in the, during the game, you score those points right then and there. Um, The other way of scoring points, as you know, is by taking out enemy units. And if it's a full squad, I think it's two points. If it's a team, it's one point. And then the commanders can be where the points are really rack up because I think you get a, um, you get a base point and then you get a, point for whatever their leadership value is off the top of my head um so yeah i mean i mean you you, you crushed you crushed me on points in that game uh even though you had more more units i just couldn't i couldn't do enough damage to uh to uh, make up the point difference I, what about the um so we talked about the card play and you have your actions and you have your so you what are they their orders and then the actions are the ones you can use, you know, basically as um, either defensive, like for yourself or in the middle of someone else's turn. And then, of course, you have the events and you have the random hexes and you have the die. Did you, um, I think, because you like multi-purpose cards, I mean, did you enjoy the, the card play of it or was it just? I I didn't find for this that the the choice of how to use the card is like a game for like Race for the Galaxy when you're going to either use it for payment or you're going to be actually using it for what's on the card. So you're either discarding it and kind of face down or you're going to be using it for the action on the card. I found with Combat Commander, I was more concerned about the orders across the top, making sure I could order my troops and the action on the card, which is, I could, you know, as Dean was saying, it could be that, you know, when you fight, you, you can play this action card. But if the order, I found the over order overrid what the action was. That if I had a card that I didn't care about the order, then I'd probably use it for the action. But if, if the order was something I really wanted to do or knew I needed to, you know, let's say I needed an advance. I don't care what the action is. I'm not going to get rid of that advanced card because I really need it. And as Dean said, a lot of this, a lot of this game I found was the your hand manipulation. Uh, there are some turns that you're just discarding cards just so you can get the the order that you really need. So, again, if, if I didn't care about the order, I'd use it for the action, or I ended up just discarding it. So I wasn't. It didn't feel as. Um, nail biting as it does in some other multi-use card games when you're when you're really kind of torn over uh, what's more more powerful i found the order overrid anything else on that card 
yeah, I had a few times in the game where it's like, well, I really, I want this order, but man, I really need, I need to have that action because I want to do this. And whether it's, you know, giving me a plus two when I'm firing or um, especially later in the game as, you know, like any game, it kind of has a, kind of has a flow to it. And later in the game, as we were getting more into close combat, having those cards in my hand that had the action was um, to break a unit was, I mean, searching through like, oh God, please, I need to find one of those. I need to find one of those. And I don't care what that order was going to be. I was going to save it for breaking that unit because uh, I knew, you know, assault's coming. So I do think there are times, it's not like maybe like a Twilight Struggle where so I can use it for, um, you know, action points versus the event sort of thing. This is more of the decision of, do I need this action or do I need this order more than I need the action? Or am I trying to set something up where I need to save this because, okay, maybe I need to save a recover card because I know, I know I'm going to get, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a unit that's going to be broken. So I need to want to try to rally or I've got, I've got three units that are broken. So I really need to have a recover card to, to get them all. Or I've got a bunch of, you know, whatever, um, 10 markers, so on and so forth. I, as far as the, um, so, you know, with the events, I know you, you didn't feel like your events were beneficial to you. My, my events were pretty, were pretty good for me. I think I got like, what, an extra leader or a hero, or I don't yeah. know, something else. And one of, I think you had like a field advancement or something like that. So you upgraded one of your, Oh yeah. It's a veteran. Yeah. And then I had like a, a, a uh, you had someone else kind of join, join the army. Yeah, out of the out of the and said, Hey, I'm part of your group now. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and your sniper wasn't worth a shit. Whereas my sniper, I think was, was spot on just about every time. So I, I am deep in the forest and Dean's sniper hits me. Me, you're out in midair and my sniper goes, okay, I'm going to shoot over there. And he fires like over there. It's like, no, no. Yeah, if, if your sniper was a traitor, he would have really helped me because he just about hit every one of your troops. And then that's kind of the thing with, with the you know with the card game. It, it is random. Oh well, yeah. Because you you have an event come up that says a sniper, and then you, you turn over another card and it says where they hit. Just so yeah. happens that when Dean when it was Dean's turn to flip for the sniper, he's always seemed to hit. And again, it's pure randomness because there's a little hex at the bottom of the of the cards that that's the only thing you're going to use for that card is just flip it over, see what hex. And that's just in the game. It didn't work in my favor. Yeah, I, I do. I guess the thing I like about the events, whether they're good for you or bad for you is it does give a, um, it, it does allow you to kind of, I guess, write the narrative of, of how you think that battle went or, you know, or whatever. Now for me, even though everything was good for me, I still lost. So, I mean, the, the field promotion, the, the, the hero straggling onto the board, it didn't help me. I mean, it, so uh, take that for what it is. And then as, as far as the, the dice being on the cards, I know we talked about this because you're like, well, it's not really, it's not really random then because you know exactly the number of distributions that are going to be available to, to you within your deck. And I understand that, but the randomness comes into, when you're flipping the cards, what your what value you're getting. So I, oh, yeah. I understand that yes, it's not like you it's not like you're rolling the dice and yes, I could potentially roll snake eyes five times in a row, and there probably aren't five snake eyes in that deck. So you are you do have a set number of distributions that you that you have at your yeah, and, disposal. And, and I think I like the card flipping with the dice on it more than actual rolling the dice because you know I, I'm talking probability here that if you have a deck of cards that has a set number of snake eyes in it then if you know that you got snake eyes three times in a row you will not get another snake eyes for the four because you only had three snake eyes on your deck mm -hmm. but if you're rolling dice you could roll snake eyes on every single die roll that you do it's not probable but there is a small chance you could do that with it with a fixed deck. It is impossible to roll four snake eyes in a row because there aren't four snake eyes. And I think I, I think I like that more because my penchant for rolling snake eyes when I least need them is, uh, is kind of renowned now. Well, and I think that as much as you enjoy it, I think that's another reason why some people just don't like it because they, they like to roll the dice. They, they, 
it's funny they they like the randomness of the die roll but yet their other argument will be i don't like the game because it's you know i don't have absolute control over my troops i have to rely on what cards i get so it, to me it's like okay well you like randomness here but you don't like the randomness here so sort i of think so i mean it's definitely not a game that everybody likes because of you don't have that god of war sort of ability you know you, your troops just aren't going to move exactly whenever you want them to yeah and that, with the the dice rolling thing although i was giving it like a negative with the you roll snake eyes it also means that if you look at something like descent when you have the, the bursting dice that you roll and if you roll a special symbol in the die you get to roll another die and if that one has bursting you add again mm-hmm. and again that's not going to happen to combat commander you are not going to be able to roll six 12s in a row because there aren't there aren't that many sets of, of double 12s or double sixes in your deck so if you've already known you've gone through like if you have a whole for the first half of your deck you're getting nothing but high numbers you know what's coming with strictly random die rolls when you're actually rolling physical dice the ones you've previously rolled have no impact on the the die that's going to roll next so you could have on every single turn you can always roll high if you're rolling dice you're not going to get that in combat commander so i think it's also a a way that you can help yourself strategize that if you're holding on to a car that you need really high roll rolls for, but you've just, you know, the first half of your deck was all the high rolls, then maybe it's not worth keeping the cart because the likelihood that's going to be able to trigger, you know, is going to be diminished by what you've previously turned over. All right. Did you, um, so with, with the timing mechanism in combat commander, because there are no set, there's no fixed number of rounds that you're, that you're going to play in this game. You might start with the turn marker on, say, round two and the sudden death marker on round seven. It doesn't mean the game's going to end in round seven. Could end in round four, depending on, you know, if you, know, you wipe the other person out. But the time only advances when either someone gets goes all the way through their deck, which I think each deck's 72 cards, uh, when they have to reshuffle, it'll move the time marker, and then you can do a couple things, you know, that, that are at the end of that phase. Or if you are flipping the cards for the die uh, for the die roll, and it triggers and it says time, then you're automatically going to reshuffle your deck and move the time marker. We only, I think, triggered it maybe twice by the time cards, or by, by, the, by the die roll time, maybe two yeah. or three times at the most. One time we had to work through our decks, um, quite a few times to advance the time marker. Do you, did you like the fact that there's no, like, you know, that there's no set time or do, I mean, I, I th- thought this game, I mean, of course we were playing on bass, so it's an introductory game. Um, I th- thought it, you know, took quite a bit of time to play it. Part of that is because we didn't get a whole lot of time events on our, on our card play to, to speed it up. The other part is because it was a learning game. But do you like it from the standpoint of, okay, I don't know exactly when this game's going to end, but it's also in my hands. Like I, I could wipe you out or I could get like, cause so if I, if you take enough of my units out and I, you know, cause you put them on the little tracker at the, at the, um, on the board, each of us can only take so many eliminations before we automatically surrender. And then of course, you know, you can end it by, by the time, by the time mechanism. So you can force it. If you just go, you know, hog wild and take somebody else out, or it could go to sudden death because, you know, it may not end when the, when the first sudden death triggers, you may have to go another time and, you know, trigger it that way. So I, I, for me, I like the, the fluidness, if that's a word of, of the time aspect, because I've played it this game before where I'm way ahead on points. And so my only thing is to, is to get through my deck. And sometimes it's more advantageous. I just discard, just discard. Cause I want to get through my deck. Cause I want to trigger, I want to trigger that sudden death um, die roll. Or as I think you found sometimes in, in this game, deciding of, okay, I've got a squad, a machine gun team um, in, in this hex. And I've got the commander, I've got units around. It. So I could, if I've, activate if i do this fire order i could potentially fire off you know four different units well do i want to put the squad and the machine gun together and just do one better die roll or do i want to have them fire separately 
So it forces you to use more cards and I get to use more cards. But for every time I fire, you've got to take a defensive, you know, you got to flip one of your cards. And so sometimes it's that it's not only for a time aspect, but sometimes you're just hoping that you get that freaky event or you get that freaky sort of thing that triggers something else off where maybe they run away. I, I like that aspect of the game. I did too. I don't think I fully appreciated it as I was playing the, I was so concentrating trying to learn my deck and learn how I could overcome you being in the building to try and get you out that the whole manipulation of the time, I don't think played too much into my decisions. It was more of what's going to give my best chance of overcoming you. Like you're saying with his stack or whether you're going to do each one individually or whether they're going to go as a unit. It's like, well, if I do it as a unit, then my leader is going to give me a, you know, a, a plus whatever. Uh, so it's going to make it easier for me to try and hit you. Uh, I think if I was trying to rush the end, I probably would have split them all up to make, you know, to make you go through more cards. Um, it's an interesting aspect, but like I said, for my first play, it wasn't, it was, it was several layers deeper than I was playing at. All right. So I guess my final question would be, I know when we were done playing, um, you weren't jumping up and down for, for joy after playing it. You did say that you would, would play it again. But you're like, well, I want to add, you know, I had all these, I had all these artillery cards that I never got to use. So let's, let's do one with artillery. And I, I warned you then, okay, well, you'll never get those artillery cards again at the right time. But um, yeah, again, Fat Lipke is a very much an introductory scenario. Um, so there are things, definitely things that you can add to it. That's going to give it more depth, more strategy and things like that. But um, I guess, was it, was it more than you? thought it was going to be or, or did it kind of turn you off from the from the gmt style of, of games is it more than you want to invest i guess more time and effort than you want to invest i think for me the big stumbling block is what i mentioned before is i ended up enjoying my play of combat commander but for the first half of the game i was really frustrated because i hadn't learned how i was supposed to approach that russian group that I was I was leading and I think the next time I go into it it's going to be more of looking at whatever side I play whatever scenario I play it's going to be looking more into the history of okay this is how they approached it through the designer notes or whatever else so that's the way I need to approach my side and you know yeah it's kind of frustrating when you are playing that first scenario and you you have a whole handful of artillery cards you can't use because there's not artillery in it, but that's part of the, the gameplay. So I, I do want to play it again. And I would, it's kind of like a caveat to anybody else who's watching this that hasn't played a war game before. And again, I have no idea what the other war games are like, but from combat commander, it was, you have to go into it, not thinking you can approach the game, however you want to approach it. You have to look at your thematic historical aspect for the game. So if you're going to play the Russians in this battle, this is what they did. And you're kind of geared towards following those same guidelines. Yes, you can try and you know take pot shots or do something slightly different, but your strengths are this, and you really need to be playing towards those strengths. Um, and I think that's going to take me a couple more games to kind of get over that mentality of, okay, I have to throw out the preconceived notion that I can approach the game however I want to pro approach it and look at the historical... Uh, theme of this battle of this army whatever else say okay i now understand what their strengths are so i need to be playing to that that strength yeah i think you know playing to the strength of your nationality but also i mean the terrain the map is going to dictate a lot of it you know if it's depending on the type of terrain it is i mean it's just gonna you know it, it has an effect i mean you have to take that into account and then of course whatever the objectives are so um you know, the best laid plans sometimes just don't, uh, don't work out. And then of course, then you have the, the, the card play in it as well. So I, for me, I, I like the asymmetry as much as there is within it. I mean, the more the asymmetry is more the, the type of units you have and their firepower, their, um, their, their um, movement rates and stuff like that. And maybe some of the weapons, the decks, 
have some asymmetry, but they're not as much as you would think, perhaps, at least with the, with the base orders and, and actions, maybe more in the events. But the, um, you know, the, the scenarios in the maps and the victory conditions and stuff like that, and then the starting, you know, the, the starting orders of battle and what type of troops you get, definitely, um, definitely make it interesting each time. It makes you have to, to really think about how you want to approach the game, so... I would say if anybody is is watching this and they they've never played a, a war game, but they like the idea of combat commander, um, I would say just be prepared to have that rule book beside you. It's not again what you are doing makes sense, and you need to play the card to to move your troops or to advance or to fire or whatever else. That is easy enough to grasp, but it's the okay. Well, how do I fire? That's when you open up the rule book and kind of go through the steps. And it's a very it's a well done rule book. Just don't try and expect to read the rule book once, clear it aside, and play the game without the rule book. It's one of these uh-huh. things when going, okay, I'll have this card that does this. I know I want to fire against Dean in a building. Grab the rule book. Okay, so how does this work? And it, it will come to you. Um, so it's not insurmountable, and the rule book is, is well laid out. It's just that whole thing of, okay, well, what terrain are you on? What terrain are they on? Is there a fence in between you? Is there, you know, they're in the building. Are you going to fire as a stack or fire individually? That's all laid out for you in the rule book. But when you first read the rule book, that's where it kind of got a little daunting for me. So I would say that if you are approaching this as a first time war gamer, and if you like heavier, like mid to heavy Euro games, then this may be where you want to dabble your toes in, but just be prepared for that the reliance on the rule book for it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I mean, well, with the, it's just like a heavy Euro game. I mean, you're always referring back to the, to the rule book and combat commander. I mean, I refer to it all the time in the middle of the game because you're just not going to memorize everything and you don't need to. Yep. That's the great thing about it. you just need to learn the basics of how things flow and then play it. You're, you're going to learn through playing it. Uh, that's, that's the only way that you're, that you're going to learn the game. Um, you know, even when I used to play a lot with Dan, I was just like, let's just play. And hey, if we get it wrong, we get it wrong. We'll figure it out. And you know what, if I do something really stupid, like run down an open road in front of a machine gun, guess what? I probably won't make that mistake a second time uh, if we play it, but uh, in GMT with their rule book, I mean, they have a nice index at the back, um, which kind of, you know, helps you out, but yeah, don't, I mean, yes, the rule books can be intimidating because you're going to have a rule book and then you'll have a playbook and you know, you'll have whatever, and you can read them all feel free, but you don't need to, you don't need to go way into the weeds in order to play the game. Just, Throw it out there, play around with it, play, play it by yourself before you sit down and play with someone else, just to try to figure out, you know, how things work. There's some great tutorial videos out there on combat commander. I would encourage you to, to check them out. Um, I don't know what, what the title of it is on YouTube, but if you look at the BGG homepage for um, combat commander, I'm sure they're linked there. Patrick Havert, um, no, not Patrick, Patrick Pence has some, some really good, tutorial videos and he does his on vassal which will then also help you learn how to use vassal as well the, will the game play faster in person sure i mean we played it on vassal and there's just things to to learn about vassal but um yeah it it, it worked i mean it was it allowed us to get it played so any any final thoughts on combat commander uh, are you I'm, selling your copy no i think i'm going to keep my copy Actually, that's a good good question. My first response is yes, I'm going to keep it, but I don't know who I'm going to play it with. I well, can't... the good thing about it, if you keep it though, and we play on Vassal, it's it's a good reference point to have in hand. Yeah, and, and that's I definitely had the rule book beside me. Um, I also had I think I had my deck beside me, but I didn't I didn't look at my deck, and maybe if I did more, I would have realized more of the strengths of my my thing. But from playing with other people, I don't know anybody else that would want to play because it's a two-player game and my main if i'm going to play two players it's almost always going to be with my wife and she is not a huge um direct confrontation gamer so whether that's a euro game or a war game doesn't matter but if it's just you against me and, and it's just me killing off your people and you killing off my people that's not her favorite uh topic but then um, you can get the mediterranean to, uh box which has the italians in it yeah and then maybe that that's the way i can bring her into it 
but again, it, it's just not her style of, of game. Right. So I understand. I enjoyed the game. I'm, I'm glad I own it. But I think the only time I'm going to play it would be with yourself or someone else who probably already owns the, cop- the, the copy anyway. So do I need my copy? Probably not. But I'm going to keep it just in case. There you go. All right. So um, I think it's going to bring this episode to an end. I don't, we haven't even talked about what we're going to play next. Um, we're going to try, try out some other stuff or maybe we'll try another combat commander episode, uh, episode combat commander scenario. Uh, but I definitely have some other ones I've been looking at right now. It's just going to be dependent upon if they're on Vassal. Uh, Cause that's probably how we're going to have to play them at least for the, for the near future until, uh, until the borders open up or we storm across them and, <laughs> take back what was rightfully ours <laughs> so all right uh i don't know we don't have any fancy endings set for this episode so no but i i just figured that since we went from uh, tabletop battles to combat commander those like the first baby steps in so i'm expecting something really complex next like a rated 4.5 game that you're going to introduce to me next is the, the next logical step in war gaming I don't think they have any monster games on Vassal. That would be brutal to have to play something like that. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll find something in between Combat Commander and Tabletop Battles. Okay. It is, again, it's just going to depend on if they're if they're on a Vassal. I did clip a bunch of counters last night while I was sitting watching the baseball game on TV. That it's a whole other thing I don't understand. I, and I've seen people on Twitter showing pictures of them clipping the corners of all their their tits. I'm like, why? And I did, uh, so I did three games. Two of them were from Legion and each of them had about 300 counters in them. So you figure you're, you're clipping four corners on every counter. So I clipped about 2,400 corners last night. My, my hand's a little sore. <laughs> so I was feeling it by the, by the end. I'm like, Oh God, I'm like, how many more do I have? Cause I have the handheld, uh, clipper. Yeah. I, I'm feeling it right through here right now. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll have to uh, take a day off from clipping counters. Yeah. So, all right. Well, until next time, as always, please take care of yourselves and your loved ones. See ya.